the last part which will be the result for lunch that will be a panel discussion. And the focus will be determined in the digital transformation at work. We did it in the next week. For that, first I'd like to invite our panel moderator, Tushagar, Director Commercial with the Union Limited. Thank you, Tushagar. Thank you, sir, for your time. Good afternoon. No. As business race to adapt new way of doing things in the face of disruptive technologies, procurement leaders are using digital tool to build a more efficient bottom line and greater top line. While we are doing this, there are certain questions which keep coming to us, like how to adapt technology, how digital procurement really looks like, how to promote innovation, and new ways of working in e-procurement environment. So these are the questions which we will be answering in our uh, panel discussions today. We will first start with Tanishtha Ganguly and she will lay a broad outline about the digital transformation. Thank you, Tisha. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so the question um, I have is, um, you know, how do we measure, what, how do we consider, what do we consider really the key factors for an enterprise digital um, transformation? I quickly try to answer it uh, three big points. Uh, the first point, which is an important factor, is really coming from the leadership team, the vision. Right? The vision and the outcome and defining it for your uh, entire employer, de defining it for your company. The second important point is change management or communication. How do you effectively uh, make your employees, your stakeholders understand why you are going through a digital uh, transformation in the first place. And then the third part comes to the digital part, which is you know, um, choosing the technology and then um, you know, building in the capabilities uh, in the company. Right? Uh, we, most of the time, we think digital technology, digital uh, transformation is you know, put in a system, integrated new systems, but you know, honestly, technology takes a backseat. Back seat. It's really more important to define the vision and the outcome and get your stakeholders, which is your own team members, your own employees on board. Why should we even do this? You know, what is the potential client that I will uh, on board? What is the product I'm going to put in front of, uh, in the market, right? So those are the kind of questions that the leadership team should answer first. And the second most important is, how do you take your vision to the last person in your organization? Right, the communication. You can never communicate enough. How do you keep, build that confidence and the buying in your own company before you even go to the uh, external your suppliers or other stakeholders? So I think, in a natural, um, 
these would be the key points that we should, uh, we would look at for a transformation. Now I will be asking Mr. Harish Anand, who is from Ivalua, about how digital procurement really looks like and how organizations are adapting to e-procurement to especially in the uh, direct spend space because this is comparatively new area in which there is an automation work going on for indirect procurement for some time the work is already there. So how uh, your organization is helping uh, 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 automation in direct procurement? Thanks, Mr. Shah. And uh, so, what I would say is if you look at your evolution of uh, e-procurement tools, and uh, it started with your uh, e-options, and uh, predominantly the focus was more on your uh, indirect categories. But I think as the technology is evolving, and especially I think uh, in the manufacturing, where you have a significant amount of your uh, direct spend. So today, uh, you know, when you look at e-procurement, uh, you know, you're not just looking at your indirect spend, but you know, you want to kind of digitize your uh, processes for your direct spend, your services spend, and your uh, capex spend. And maybe if I look at maybe, you know, uh, let's say your uh, maybe you know uh, three dimensions. So maybe starting with let's say your uh, maybe, you know your supplier onboarding qualification. And uh, you know it is very easy to maybe, you know build up a registration form and do some verification checks. But you know today organizations have uh, adapted your e procurement tools where they have digitized their entire onboarding process. They have digitized their all change request management that happens in your supplier life cycle. It could be a change in the name of the legal entity, your bank accounts, or you know your change in address, or you know they want to extend the supplier to new categories. So you know, that's what has been done today. Uh, if I look at uh, maybe you know, uh, more from the sourcing perspective, and I think uh, in the morning we were discussing that uh, you know maybe how we can improve your UI UX, and uh, we talked about uh, you know if, if a category manager or buyer is actually getting ready for a registration meeting today with one click, you know you can get that uh, you know who are the suppliers for those, those categories, what's the share of business. What is their past performance? What is the capacity? You know, what's the open view? You get that information with one click of a mouse, uh, and uh, you know you can also kind of when it comes to direct material, and uh, you know that's where I've seen that there are different category specifications. So let's say if you are negotiating your uh, let's say maybe a packaging category, right? So maybe you negotiate on your all drivers which are driven by your let's say your pure oil, your conversion factors and all that, if you're buying your uh, logistics, I think you define your needs. So there are a lot of nuances and all that which are there for your specific categories. So today, you know, the e procurement tools are uh, catering to those kind of uh, category templates where you can define your PCO uh, models, so you can do your NPV calculations. The other important thing is, uh, you know, in terms of coexisting with your ERP system, right? So because you can't expect buyers to kind of get the PR from ERP and you know, kind of punch it into your, uh, uh, let's say, uh, e-procurement tool. The information should seamlessly flow into your e-procurement tool, your demand consolidation should happen, and with one click you create your RFQs, you generate your code summaries, and uh, running your audit scenarios. So that's where the technology has evolved to kind of uh, take care of uh, you know, all categories. And, uh, Maybe the next piece I'll take is on the contract management. And uh, we have listened to contract management. If you look at, let's say, your direct material, you know, there are a lot of SLAs. So let's say if you're buying, let's say, for example, coal. You know, there are SLAs which are linked to your moisture, the SLAs which are linked to your transit losses. So how do you measure that? And you know, in your downstream cycle, you're able to do your reconciliation, you're able to kind of you know, calculate penalty and bonuses. I think that's where I would say your e-procurement has evolved today. And uh, you know, I would say when you're looking at an e-procurement solution, you know, you should look at maybe the capability to address all your categories, all your suppliers, irrespective of size, so the small suppliers, big size suppliers, large suppliers, you need your CXM and EA connectivity. I think that's the way one should look at, and this is the way I'm seeing working with my customers how e-procurement is working. Thank you. Asian Paints has done quite a remarkable job for the automation and for IT tools. So Harish will take us through the journey which Asian Paint has done in the e-procurement.
Yeah, I think. Hello, am I audible? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, thanks, Vishal. And uh, really, I think uh, today's morning session will really set the stage on how uh, you know, technology uh, is going to be a key enabler in the science of Luka. So, uh, really talking about how Asian Paints uh, adopted this journey. Uh, I think what Anisha pointed out that really, it's really beginning uh, from you know, the company vision and top down. So what we did uh, as part of Asian Paints' own uh, transformation journey from being a paint company to you know, uh, a decor a journey, we looked at the entire value chain and uh, looked at how each value chain needs to be uh, you know, uh, disrupted with the help of digital. So it's very easy to imagine what most companies end up doing on the customer space, right? Your, uh, in a social media or uh, interact with you on websites. But as you move upstream, the challenge becomes quite different. Uh, and uh, particularly for this topic, uh, when we looked at both logistics and procurement, and also upstream of manufacturing, uh, what we really looked at is how do we enable the uh, procurement function. And if we had the uh, procurement as a strategic function, given that around 60 to 65% is any the procurement cost in the paint industry. So we really looked at how do we uh, you know, enable the buyers and the entire vendor ecosystem. So we said it's not about just our direct vendors, but really the entire ecosystem of vendors and also the entire life cycle of how the vendors would uh, deal with uh, Asian paint. So we evolved a model which was using digital to transform this uh, you know, the supplier centric world and digital transformation for the buyer centric world. In both areas, uh, the first thing we had to obviously eliminate was the transactional disruption because unless you take care of the day to day key points, really you can't go in the strategic zone. So we did that both for the suppliers and the buyers. So on the supplier side, obviously, uh, the, you know what Vishal also mentioned, the uh, you know, indirect and direct procurement, a lot of tools and technologies are available which uh, you know, touches right from uh, the uh, vendor onboarding, the entire supply life cycle management. For us, in the direct material, it's a formulated product. So, really, it's not about uh, you know, generally opening up a e auction and people you know, bidding. It's about really making that vendor go through an entire uh, research and development process. So, there's a fairly, uh, I would say, two to three month onboarding process with a lot of nuances. So, modeling that entire flow uh, and really keeping tab of you know, the entire project life cycle. So, that was on the entire the supply life cycle management, including in time we started going on the upstream, which really came in handy in the Zuka world because the chemical uh, upstream value chains are uh, quite integrated and global. So any disruption in upstream would affect maybe you know four or five of your vendors who potentially for you were uh, you know alternate vendors. So you felt they have direct supply supply chain, but that one key supplier can disrupt all your four suppliers out there. So having an entire network with it. And assigning risk scores uh, was what we kind of ended up doing. But this can only work if, uh, if the buyer side is also kind of equally digitally enabled. So on the uh, transaction part, obviously we created the uh, supplier workbench, uh, the entire transactional part, and all the MIS analytics. But one aspect which I would say is still work in progress is to see how do we really feed in the intelligent data. So a lot of external sources data can come in either from your you know, the ISIS or any of the, uh, uh, you know, uh, Bloomberg or any of the data feeds. But really, how does the supplier add value on top of their understanding? So we kind of borrowed from the world of Wiki and said that we create a supplier Wiki where, you know, each vendor kind of adds on their nuance on what's exactly happening in this week. And that becomes the enterprise knowledge repository. So I think that's the holy grail which we still have to kind of crack. But overall, I think that has been the journey at Asian Pink. Obviously, it's a work in progress, but definitely the time is kind of right to, uh, you know, really accelerate the journey here. Thank you. Now, Harsh. Hello. Thank you. Now, Harsha will take us through about what are the time values for digital transformation exercises and what are the key parameters to be considered for optimum time and value. Thanks, Sushya. So, I mean, as we're all on the verge of digital transformation, every company is a work in progress uh, when it comes to procurement digital transformation. But one of the things that we have learned from <coughs> some of our best customers is that uh, 
How how agile can we be? What is the time to value uh, which we have in this? I mean, requirements are changing. Requirements of the industry are changing so drastically. I mean, no one would have expected so much would change uh, with COVID, right? So, if the entire transformation takes about, let's say, eight months, twelve months, sometimes even a year, and then you realize that you know this is not what you had expected. So, it, so basically, try fast, fail fast, right? For that, you need to be agile. So, how do you achieve that in the minimum amount of time? So that you know the users do not lose interest at the end of the day, saying that you know something is coming, something is coming at the end of the day. So three key areas which we feel uh, would be really important for us to achieve this uh, minimum time to value. First is after, of course, this is all after you choose a partner, right? Uh, we are looking at the configuration versus customization. Most of this is something which we really need to understand at the time of evaluation. What amount of it is a configuration of the system which you can get started from day one? What amount of it is customization for which you need to write code on top of your existing uh, systems? Uh, we, we have seen with configurations, any kind of flows, any kind of requirements, industry specific, category specific, can be done uh, real time. And the second biggest challenge which contributes to the time to value is the change management, right? I mean, we have seen how suppliers, uh, I mean, many questions were around how do suppliers uh, adopt to our complex uh, uh, systems, they have their own ways, they are very comfortable with Excel. So maybe think about uh, technologies which can let them work the way they are doing. How can they work on their Excel sheets or Word documents and how can that integrate back to your uh, uh, existing tech stack? So that you, know, you have very minimal change management overall, right? On the supplier side and of course on the internal user side as well, right? How can they continue to the work the way they have been doing? And it, you can get started in almost a real time, uh, right? And so these are uh, configurability, uh, user experience. And then the last part would be, let's say, the AI. This is what is changing the deployment cycles uh, very fast, wherein you don't have to put in a lot of business rules, conditions for every single customer, which takes away the time till six months or 12 months, depending on every, depends on how complex the use case is, right? So how can you use AI, which can learn on the go from your existing cases, scenarios and rules, and try to learn from you and become better at it, uh, right, with every single. Because today I'm there, tomorrow some other category manager replaces me, the data and the intelligence what AI is building at the back end can consistently keep learning, evolving on the go. So that, these are the three things which we have seen contribute to the success of, you know, an agile deployment and the time to value for enterprises, right? Things to look out for. Now I will request Latesh to tell us about the role of RPA. Yeah, firstly, let me just touch upon the macro subject which we have said, you know, digital is the next wave. Uh, as we heard, uh, you know, Harsha also talking and Harish also talking about some Asian things that they are already embarked into this journey. And uh, I also feel that, you know, digital wave has already began, right? And those who have embarked into this journey and matured has been, uh, has seen successes, and especially during the pandemic, you know, we have seen the success, you know, people who have matured in the digital uh, journey. So while every organization has, uh, you know, in some stage or the other, they are in the uh, digital journey, uh, I believe that in this journey, what is the role of RPA? Now, as far as, uh, you know, if I, if, I, if I take an example of why there are enough and more, you know, systems which are already in place, I still feel that there are about 10 to 25 percent of employees still doing some repetitive tasks, okay? Time-consuming, you know, process-based tasks. Now, is this something which we can really look at and automate? The answer is yes. Okay. And robotic process automation is the answer for that, right? Now, if I have to quote an example of invoice processing, it's a very simple example, but I'm just taking that example so that we all understand that. Right, invoice processing, uh, which is a laborious task, which has a lot of activity, starting from you know uh, categorizing the invoice to extracting the data from the invoice, punching the data into the procurement system, validating that process, and then you know the receipts and the payments. Right. Now, if you look at these tasks, these are laborious intensive. Right. Can this be automated? 
yes, yes this, this can, can be automated, automated. right and uh, the, the entire, entire processes, processes can be so much automated that the almost about 70 to 75 percent of the employees who are spending you know this laborious task they could be eliminated in terms of they doing the uh, much more uh, smarter work than doing the hard work leaving the hard work to the robotic process automation tool and uh, the employees spending time on more intelligent and smart work right so my uh, overall I, if i have to summarize so rpa not just supports uh, the digital transformation but it makes achieve this uh, transformation quick and straightforward thank you now i will be asking vikram about how supply chain can be de-risked with the digital transformation and i will also be asking him for his experience in the automotive space sure. so i'll uh, start with the uh, automotive space first let me introduce myself i am vikram joshi taking care of digitalization and analytics for uh, mahindra and mahindra uh, so in automotive space uh, it has been a journey of uh, no decades uh, 1980s 1990s uh, there was a focus on getting a strategic procurement in place uh, 1990s brought to the notice that you know, multiple processes need to be standardized we need to have a good process in place it got developed over the 1990s and uh, there was a focus on how the e procurement can be done so 1990s and 2000s is where there was a lot of focus on having multiple tools so we uh, move away from individual uh, you know, uh, applications which are being used for enterprise and uh, we can do more sophisticated on our software like uh, SAP and uh, or I can do more segmentation going on. Uh, what the entire automotive industry is now focusing on is how the sourcing can be made more intelligent now. So looking at the categories in a meaningful way, what kind of insights you can want to generate which are very specific and does not consume a lot of your time. So intelligent alerts going to people and making sure that you know the right kind of uh, focus is there uh, from category, your individual team and supplier perspective. So that's the focus area which we are looking at within the automotive industry. And we shall uh, talk about the uh, supplier risk part that you said. Uh, in our organization, we have a, we have an application which is uh, internally developed called Spend Analytics. Uh, it started off with uh, transactional data getting loaded and utilized into the system. And uh, over the years, we have matured into a system which is having nine algorithms just for the cost reduction uh, perspective. So we are we are prescribing where the costs are uh, you know, uh, high and which are different outliers so which can be you know, uh, worked upon. It becomes a priority list for my sourcing buyers to focus on their major uh, component of cost structure. Uh, what the last uh, couple of years have taught us uh, with the pandemic coming in is uh, just working on cost is not going to help you run the business. So you have to focus on how the business continuity is doing. And uh, you know, it, it demands kind of flexibility that needs to come through. So, you know, uh, I should be in a position to flex when the cost should be given higher to secure my cost. Right? And uh, uh, as the time term, as the business scenario changes, I should be in a position to look at how I can go and optimize my cost and uh, cycle balance. So, uh, what it needs is, uh, you know, it's a three-pound strategy that we are working on currently. Uh, we are focusing on the visibility, uh, we are focusing on integrated platform, and then intelligent sourcing, how it can come out. Uh, so what do I mean by the visibility part is, uh, look at best of best solutions and uh, go ahead and implement those individual scenarios. Uh, for supply risk, uh, it can be, as you are aware, it's a, it's a wide area starting from raw uh, material commodity imports to individual suppliers going financially bad. It could also be your own strategy which is not working well for your uh, individual plans. So these are different aspects of uh, uh, risk which uh, are going to create a lot of uh, issues for the sourcing buyers. So work with uh, solution providers who are having an experience.
expertise into these areas. Some of the you know, applications I have mentioned is presentation uh, in the morning, uh, like RS methods, uh, resilient and multiple other solutions which are available, uh, who are able to give a good amount of insights uh, on the external factors. There are also efforts which we are taking to integrate uh, multiple new sources and try and get relevant information for my sourcing. Uh, so this is all on the part of visibility. Get best of the best what is there in the industry. Have it uh, uh, brought on board in the individual POC or individual biometric uh, uh, products, MVPs, minimum biometric products. And uh, once you have this in place, uh, my buyer is not going to log in 10 different systems. They want to look at what is happening in the external uh, uh, market, what is affecting my products, what is affecting my uh, uh, normal uh, content, and uh, what kind of best uh, sources that they need to figure out. So the, the person is not going to log into 10 different systems trying to figure out what the uh, uh, next step should be. So that's why the need of an integrated platform is what we are uh, working on right now. Uh, so it becomes, uh, you know, all the systems are sharing in a very easy manner uh, with a good uh, user interface uh, what the uh, people need to see for their individual uh, business problems. And those individual tiles are created or applications are created so that they can just click on and get the relevant information. And uh, the third part of intelligent sourcing is what we're looking at is uh, uh, from the most relevant information that should be available at the fingertips, right? So the category management part that I spoke about, or the uh, team's performance and suppliers' uh, performance, uh, all of that needs to come into uh, a particular individual uh, bias, uh, you know, either a team channel or emails in the form of links. So just to give you an example, uh, we have a system in place which was not to identify the critical alerts. Uh, getting input from 80 plus new sources and all of our subscribers are mapped. We are able to get the information uh, on each channel at a specific time for those individual critical alerts for uh, individual uh, commodity buyers. Now, that's a smart way rather than looking at an email which is coming in with 50 different alerts and trying to find out which supplier is applicable to my area. So, these are the areas that we are working on to you know, come out of the Thank you. Last question. I will again like to talk to her. Thank you. 
and build up those formulas, integrate with your you know, sites like LME and ICS and all that, and build the intelligence. So basically, kind of keep on incrementally improving the processes. So this is it. What we have tried to cover is basic concept, how to implement that concept, and also the real-time case studies from automated space, Mahindra and Mahindra, and uh, Asian fields. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, thank you, sir. While you're looking for uh, uh, the topic, um, I'm Avinash. Uh, I would like to talk about how does digital procurement look actually like in, uh, in reality. So, uh, trying to use a cliche phrase, uh, whether you like digital or you hate digital, you cannot avoid digital, right? And procurement is not insulated from it. So, uh, procurement actually is very uniquely placed uh, in the organization to connect uh, businesses to uh, the suppliers. And uh, going forward, the uh, businesses will expect us to really work with the suppliers to form a new business models or innovative business models that will give competitive advantage. So while we will continue to deliver value to our three uh, pillars of uh, category excellence, scheme excellence, and supplier excellence, what we will be expected to do is to be more creative uh, in our, uh, in our uh, uh, delivery. So, uh, one of the studies by BCG actually shows that uh, the skills of procurement team is going to change for more, they are going to morph into more of data analytics and uh, so creative solution. Uh, so going ahead and looking in the future, you see there will be a biomic organization where there will be a blend of uh, machine and digital skills with human skills and procurement has to prepare for that. And earlier, uh, panelists did talk about uh, upstream and downstream procurement. So before you really embark on a procurement journey, it will be important to assess the requirements of this upstream or downstream processes because uh, both these segments, the requirements are totally different. So uh, a panelist talked about RPA, why RPA is very important in, uh, important, uh, in downstream. Uh, upstream uh, requirement is totally different in terms of spend analysis, spend visibility, and uh, advanced analytics, and uh, connected supplier, digital supplier uh, management platforms. So solutions, digital solutions that we have to focus on that type of. Uh, while we, uh, uh, the transformation, digital transformation seems to be overwhelming, it will be important to understand that we should be focusing on uh, mix. Outcomes. So it, I, I think it could be a new product. Like I think earlier the lecture said, that now teams are working on new products. So it could be new products or a new process or a business use case. So for example, uh, we can start by a business use case in dynamic spend uh, or a business use case for AI-based supply uh, supply chain categorization or supply segmentation. So using those business use cases will help us to really uh, show success very quickly. And uh, then that uh, people do not get bogged down by very large processes and transformation uh, uh, change management processes. Uh, the last one thing that I would like to also say is uh, uh, procurement team now will have to really use tech for becoming efficient and digital tools for becoming creative. So that, that is something like uh, it will be important from procurement team to uh, change our mindset, culture, we have to be, uh, we have to learn fast, fail quick, uh, and then uh, also be experimentative, embrace change and work on really cross function things. Thank you.
मैं आपको फोन करूँ चेक करके